Hey everyone, this is Ryan here, and welcome back to our periodontic series. We've now talked about non-surgical and surgical therapy in periodontics, but I do have a few treatments left that I want to cover, so I'm going to group those into a category called adjunctive treatment. So antibiotics are also used in the treatment of periodontal disease, and antibiotics aim to decrease the number of bacteria in the periodontal pocket. Well, this makes sense because antibiotics target bacteria, and bacteria, as being part of plaque, again, is the initiating factor in periodontal disease. So by this reasoning, antibiotics should help uh, heal periodontal disease. The antibiotics should only be used as an adjunct to mechanical debridement during phase one. Now, phase one consists of all of the non-surgical options we've talked about, plaque control, patient education, scaling and root planing, and local and systemic antibiotics are included in this phase as well, since they're non-surgical. Antibiotics should not be used for all cases of periodontitis, though. For the board exam, remember that the aggressive form of periodontitis is where antibiotics are most often employed. So localized aggressive periodontitis would be the time when you want to use antibiotics. Also, just for comprehensiveness sake, refractory periodontitis, which is, uh, this is referring to cases of periodontitis that do not resolve despite undergoing all of the proper treatment, that's also a case when you'd go and add in antibiotics as part of your treatment regimen. So remember A for aggressive, A for antibiotics, and aggressive periodontitis is also the type of periodontitis linked to that really long name, the AA bacteria. So you can remember all of those A's and group them together. So bactericidal and bacteriostatic drugs should not be given at the same time. I have an antibiotics pharmacology video for more in-depth information on antibiotics, but basically, cidal means that they're killing the bacteria, static means that it's stopping their growth, and you don't typically want to combine uh, the two at the same time. Tetracyclines concentrate in the gingival curricular fluid, and this is a great feature of tetracyclines because where are the plaque bacteria that we're concerned about? Typically in the periodontal pocket and gingival curricular fluid is constantly bathing that area. So if we have an antibiotic that's concentrating right there, it's going to do its job pretty effectively. So doxycycline being one of the tetracyclines is often prescribed in this case. It only requires one dose per day, which may improve patient compliance. It's not like they have to take it four times a day. So only taking it one time a day can help with that. The most common and arguably most effective antibiotic regimen for periodontal disease is a combination of amoxicillin and metronidazole. So amoxicillin given 500 milligram tablets three times a day, metronidazole, 250 milligram tablets also three times a day for 14 days is a typical prescription for periodontal disease. Um, and this is, a, this is a really effective drug combination. The duration is more important than the dose. So if you only gave, if you gave double the dose for seven days, it wouldn't be as effective as giving this dosage for 14 days. So the longer you're taking the antibiotic, the more effective it's going to be to tackle periodontal disease. Also want to avoid alcohol consumption with the metronidazole, some nasty side effects there. All right, so as we've uh, talked about systemic antibiotics, there are also local delivery antibiotics. So these are delivered right into say a specific pocket that's being rather uh, stubborn and not resolving, you can choose to deliver the antibiotics just to that area. So the specific guidelines for the LDA use is when you have localized recurrent that are, that are not going away, residual that are not going away, pro probing depths that are greater than or equal to five millimeters with inflammation, 
They're still present, they're not going away, following conventional therapies. So there are three different types of commonly used locally delivered antibiotics that are Arrestin, Atrodox, and Periochip. And these are actually common board questions because um, for whatever reason, it's important to know the names and there's a really easy way to remember what antibiotic goes with the uh, common drug name. So Arrestin has this in part of the name that lines up with the N of minocycline. So you remember arrestin, minocycline, atridox, doxycycline, and periochip with the CH goes with chlorhexidine. And you don't really need to remember the gluconate part. So if you just remember the, the similarities between uh, th these names and these names, you really just have to remember one or the other. And then if a question asks what antibiotic is part of atridox, so you can remember the dox matches with doxycycline. Okay, so we've talked about antibiotics. Now let's talk about host modulation therapy. And this is actually really interesting. It's a little bit newer, and host modulation therapy aims to downregulate the destructive aspects of the host response. So it's really interesting I think it's a really interesting approach to tackling periodontitis, and it works. Again, plaque is the initiating factor, and most of our therapy up to this point, both non-surgical and surgical, is to remove plaque and local factors that favor its accumulation. But we also talked about how the second part of the equation is that the host, the patient's body, responds to this bacterial challenge by upregulating and sending all these disease-fighting white blood cells and pro-inflammatory mediators that ironically lead to tissue destruction. So, host modulation therapy is designed to tackle this second part of the equation. As with antibiotics, it should only be used as an adjunct to the mechanical cleaning as part of during uh, as part of phase 1. And this is in contrast to antibiotics, which are used for the aggressive form of periodontitis, this should be limited to the chronic form of periodontitis. So there are three different types of medicaments that we use as part of host modulation therapy systemically. So these are taken um, you know, orally or by some systemic means, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs, inhibit prostaglandins. Now prostaglandins lead to inflammation, so if you inhibit them, you inhibit inflammation. The long-term use, as with many medicines, has side effects. Bisphosphonates or are another use. They inhibit osteoclasts, and osteoclasts destroy bone, so if you inhibit them, then you inhibit destruction of bone. Also, one of the many uh, bad parts of periodontitis. So in theory, that makes sense. But as we talked about in our oral pathology videos, bronze bisphosphonate related osteonecrosis of the jaw is a significant side effect. So actually, NSAIDs and bisphosphonates, not really used here. But this one is the only one of these that's currently approved by the FDA and accepted by the ADA and that is sub-antimicrobial dose doxycycline. So doxycycline, we talked about before, is being used as both a systemic and a local antibiotic, but here it's sub-antimicrobial, which means it's less than the typical dose you would prescribe if you had a bacterial infection. So let's see what doxycycline does. It inhibits MMPs. And MMPs are collagenases, we talked about in the pathogenesis video, that are released by neutrophils that eat up the type 1 collagen in the periodontal ligament. So if you inhibit them, then you inhibit destruction of the periodontal ligament, which is great. So the dosage for this is 20 milligrams twice daily for 3 to 9 months. So it's a long time. Again, duration is better than dosage, less amount of dosage sub-antimicrobial. 
so this wouldn't be fighting any bacterial infections, but it's been proven to inhibit the uh, MMPs that are made by neutrophils. So you're modulating the host response to the bacteria, and this should be done as an adjunct to actually removing that bacterial plaque. So it's a really interesting approach, and um, I, think it's, I think it is really fascinating. Now, just as there were systemic options for um, host modulation or for antibiotics, we had systemic and local applications. For host modulation, we just talked about some systemic, we also have local options. So we can administer these host modifying agents locally. Some examples are emdegain, which is enamel matrix proteins, and PDGF, which is a growth factor. Um, so these surgical adjuncts may also influence periodontal regeneration. So interestingly enough, emdegain is actually a biologic agent used in periodontal regeneration. Remember that was one of the three Bs and the healer for guided tissue regeneration. All right, so the third adjunctive treatment we have for periodontitis is occlusal correction, because sometimes the root of the problem is malocclusion. A bad bite could actually rapidly accelerate and worsen the periodontal condition of the patient. And this is known as traumatic occlusion, where you have injury to the periodontium resulting from occlusal forces that exceed the reparative capacity of the attachment apparatus. This is basically saying you're having heavy contact or occlusal interference that is really messing up the PDL. So you can use articulating paper or occlusal indicating wax to see if we have areas of heavy contact or occlusal interference. So traumatic occlusion is broken down into two types. There's the primary type, which is caused by excessive forces on a normal, otherwise healthy periodontium, whereas secondary is caused by normal occlusal forces on a reduced periodontium. So a periodontal apparatus that's already gone a significant amount of clinical attachment loss and is already compromised from disease. Fremitus is vibration of teeth upon closing. It's a phenomenon that can be used to diagnose this or that um, you can notice upon clinical examination. So again, heavy contact or occlusal interference is going on between these two premolars, and we can see um, it's manifested quite apparently in the radiograph. Typically, it first manifests as a widened PDL, either apically or marginally, or both. This is a much more advanced case. You can easily detect the bony defect here, probably two or three wall. So some occlusal therapy you can do. Um, occlusal therapy should be delayed until after inflammation is resolved. So again, it's an adjunct to our phase one therapy where we're focusing on removing plaque. So afterwards, you could think about doing some occlusal adjustment or coronaplasty, which is selective reshaping, or recontouring of the occlusal surfaces, and interclusal appliance, also known as a bite guard or an occlusal guard. And it re it's pictured here, redistributes occlusal forces to minimize excessive force on individual teeth. Now, if this was a very obvious case where you had way too much force on one tooth and no loading on the other teeth, then of course you could, um, with the patient consent, you could go in and um, adjust the occlusion and um, seek some occlusal equal equilibration to help the situation. But these are things that, again, should be typically delayed until after the main plaque situation has been resolved. Splinting is used, um, as far as the board exam is concerned, only to improve patient comfort and function by immobilizing excessively mobile teeth. And it's not indicated for fremitus, which is that vibration phenomenon, or mobility, unless it bothers the patient. So this is all about patient comfort. You can splint teeth together that are periodontally compromised with composite or more flexible wire. Um, that's just something I wanted to include to be comprehensive. 
And the last adjunctive therapy we'll talk about in this video is furcation correction. So sometimes a furcation involvement ne makes it nearly impossible to keep clean. So um, imagine trying to keep this area underneath the root trunk of this molar clean. And you know, I don't care how good you are at oral hygiene, that's a really hard area to keep plaque from accumulating. So there's some things we can do to correct a furcation. So I have four teeth here and they're um, pictured with the gingiva here and there's a little bit of a furcation involvement that's very hard to keep clean and I'm going to show you four different treatment options you can do in order to resolve the situation. So the first one is called furcation plasty and this is to open up the furcation area and smooth it out to, to allow for better access so the patient could fit a round brush in there and keep it clean. So essentially, you move the furcation up. You make it a little bit more accessible to the patient, smooth this out so that they can keep the area clean. That's furcation plasty. Now the second option is called tunneling. This is a similar concept except we're doing the opposite. We're going to remove bone and move the tissues apically to purposely create a, a Glickman class four, which is the where you see through to the other side, facilitating the patient's ability to keep the furcation area clean. So in this treatment option, we move the tissues down. The third treatment is called root amputation or root resection. And this is where we actually cut one of the roots off. So the root is cut off, the root area is recontoured and smoothed, endodontic treatment is performed, the endodontic access is sealed with some restorative material, and a crown is placed to leave an open space for hygiene. So a common example of this would be the distobuccal root of maxillary first molar. For maxillary first molars are really uh, hard to keep clean if you have a furcation involvement. And the distobuccal root is the smallest root. And so most it's most common for root amputation because the other two roots can provide adequate support to retain the tooth. And the last treatment option we have is called hemisection. And this would involve cutting a molar in half. So hemi means half just like the earth has two hemispheres, and premolarization refers to retaining a molar functionally as two premolars. Because we've cut the tooth in half, we're gonna do the same um, endodontic treatment to make sure the pulp is cleaned out, and we retain this tooth as two premolars. So, furcation plasty, we move the furcation up, Tunneling, we move the tissues down. Root amputation, we cut off a root. Hemisection, we cut the tooth in half. All right, and that's it for this video. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed it and learned more about our periodontal therapy. We have one more video left in the series, followed by a questions video to test everything we've talked about up to this point. Thanks so much for watching everyone, and we'll see you all in the next video.